I'm Daniela Perry. I'm the Vice President of the Georgia Chamber Foundation for the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, which is the state's largest business advocacy organization. Um, and really, you know, wanted to give a huge um, shout out to all of Max's anchor investors. Um, these organizations um, really make um, things possible here at Max. So if you're enjoying our programs, um, please thank these anchor investors for making them possible. Um, we could not do it without them. So today um, we are going to have a great discussion with David Barch and Kim Meadows, really talking about um, workforce development industry and how we can stay up to date um, with our workforce development professional development. Um, so certainly um, y'all remember that if you've got questions, you know, certainly put them in the chat. Um, we'll kind of get going, but I'd love to turn it over to David and Kim for to kick us off. Good morning, and thanks for having us. It's eight o'clock my time. I, I live in Memphis, so uh, this is a great way to start the day. Um, I'm going to start just a little bit talking about NADA and, and why we actually exist. Workforce is uh, a hugely important profession to our nation. If everyone who worked uh, in workforce walked off the job today, our national economy would collapse. And when our economy collapsed, so goes the rest of the world. I think most of the people who are workforce development professionals really don't understand the importance of what they do because typically we have worked in silos for a number of years, decades. And I think the work that you're doing here uh, with Max is so important because it's such a collaborative of so many different entities that are doing workforce development. So the more we know about each other, the more we know about what our partners do, the better we are at being a workforce development professional. And ironically, this is a career that almost no one has any training for, unless maybe you're in economic development. Uh, that seems to be a more specific field that there are some majors in. Uh, so you, you actually might go to college and, and come out uh, and, and go into economic development. But as far as the majority of the people that are working in American job centers, uh, uh, whatever they're called in your state, across the nation, most of the people who are working every day to change people's lives have had no formal training. You don't come out of college with a degree as a workforce development professional. And this is such important work. So what NADAP has tried to do since its beginning over 50 years ago is to promote workforce development as a professional, uh, as a profession, and to provide professional development. Uh, so we do that in many ways throughout the year. And I know I'm kind of dominating the conversation right now, <laughs> but Kim, I'm going to talk a little bit about the CWDP, and then, you know, I'll, I'll let you talk about some very important things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but the CWDP, Certified Workforce Development Professional, a lot of research was done all across the country about 20 years ago. Uh, to find out some basic skill sets that anyone who's in workforce development, no matter where you are or no matter what your position is, these competencies or skill sets would help you be more successful in your career. So the CWDP has been around for about 20 years, about probably five years ago, and actually both Kim and I were on the Not Up board under the certification committee, we did a big delve into these nine competencies to see if they were all relevant and how many of these competencies were redundant. 
So what we found was there were five competencies out of the original nine that were still extremely relevant. The committee recommended and the board approved that we do away with four of the original nine competencies, not so much that they weren't relevant, but they were just redundant. So now there are five core competencies that the, the CWDP is based on. And you can go to the NADA website, you can click on the certification tab, we have the requirements to become a CWDP broken down A, B, C, D. So there's four requirements, and then there's a three-step application process. And we're not going to go through that today, but the reason the CWDP, that credential, is important is most of us don't have a credential in our profession. And if you're in a, a job center in Georgia and someone comes to you, you're going to want to find something that would be specific for that person, whether it's short-term training, completing some type of degree, but you want them to have something relevant in the career that they're wanting to go into. So this credential is relevant to you if you're a workforce development professional. Um, it validates the work that you do. And one of the questions that I get most often uh, whenever we're out, Kim and I exhibit a lot with at, for NADA, is, well, who am I doing this for? I don't know if my, my boss will support this. Uh, so why would I want to do it? Do it for yourself. That's why I did it. Uh, I managed uh, WIA, WIOA, Adult Youth Dislocated Worker Programs in Eastern Arkansas, and we were very strong supporters, the state of the ACT uh, uh, Job Readiness Certificate, uh, so we promoted that to everyone that came in that was part of my job as a manager was to meet with all the partners to promote this certification so that our job seekers would have something to validate their skills. So I went to a not up conference. I heard about the CWDP. I was excited that there was a credential that I could get in my career. So I got back home and I got to thinking about it and it's like, do I want to do this? And it just kind of hit me. It's like, absolutely. You need to take the advice that you give to everyone that comes in the center. You have found something that's a credential in what you do. It's, it's a short amount of training. It's a portable credential. It can go with you wherever you go. So I earned my CWDP in 2009, and it's still active today. So I believe in this credential because it is something to validate our skills, our profession, and it's also something that is an example that you can use to motivate those that you work with. So Kim, I've rambled yeah. probably enough about that. Uh, oh, I do see Great. that we have a question. The credential is good for three years. You recertify by getting 60 hours of professional development uh, in those five core competencies. The training can come from uh, Max. It can come from NADA. It can come from your state. It could be self-studies, uh, as long as it's relevant to the comp any or all of the five competencies, it would count. And NADAP has made a commitment to provide at least 20 hours of professional development related to these competencies at no cost. So once you're certified, it's very easy if you if you put out the effort, you can get your 60 hours of professional development over a three year period without cost. And then Dave, we've got two more questions that have um, come in. I'll go to Denise's question first because I think it kind of builds on what you've kind of already been sharing. Um, you know, what if you're a retired HR professional, will you qualify for this? 
you do have one of the requirements is you do need 12 months out of the last two years work experience. So if you're retired from HR and retired totally, you would need to have that 12 hours during the last two years. If you're working now in a different field, HR certainly relates to workforce development. So if your field now is something in workforce development, then you really wouldn't have a lapse period. I Perfect. hope that that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's great. And then we have another question, David, kind of, you know, what was your background coming in the field and how did you kind of get to this area? I'll be brief because I do like to ramble, but I promise I'll be brief. I had been an entrepreneur for the first half of my work life. I lost my lease. Uh, so I knew, you know, I had to do something different. I had some things to wrap up in closing my business. I did have some rental property, so some things to wrap up there. And then I went to uh, an Arkansas workforce center because I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was so fortunate. I found someone that spent a lot of time with me, helping me understand that my, my different skill sets, what they were as an entrepreneur, I did hiring, I did payroll, I, I submitted tax forms, I did inventory, uh, so many things that I didn't think would be uh, relevant to an employer. And the person, she spent so much time letting me understand, yes, employers want these skill sets. So at the end of, uh, of our session, she said, so what would you like to do? And I said, I want to do what you're doing. I would love to have the opportunity to help people understand what their skills are and how they can use them in a career. So before I left, I got a brief interview with her manager, and uh, then I got a real interview, and I started uh, as a, at the time, a interviewer uh, for the Department of Workforce Services uh, in, in Arkansas. And then shortly after that, I, I started working with the WIA program as a career advisor or case manager at the time for adult youth and dislocated workers. So 20 years later, I'm still in workforce development. <laughs> workforce development matters. I think that's the greatest commercial. Um, and I have Absolutely. one question too, and then Kim, we're going to turn it over to you real quick um, for sure. But um, we had one question again from Denise about, you know, who to talk to if they have further questions about qualification. And I'm sure we'll probably want to remind folks of that. But is there someone on y'all's team or, you know, either of you that can kind of help walk people through who's the best fit? You know, uh, yes, here is our request. Go to the website, go through the requirements, look at the application process. And if you have questions after that, because it usually does make a lot more sense after you've reviewed the requirements and all, uh, you, there's a email address at the, at the how you can contact us, or you can contact me directly. Uh, my email address is david at nadap, N -A -W -D -P dot O-R-G. Perfect. And we'll share that in the chat too, y'all. So you've got questions. Yeah, Kim Let's is so see. good. Yeah. <laughs> Great. No, we'll do that. I think I just um, sent it to the panelists though. I didn't put everyone. Oh, so <laughs> We'll send it back out. But Kim, would love Thank to turn you. it over to you too um, for your perspective remarks. And then everybody keep the questions coming and, and we'll keep um, the discussion moving. Thank you. Well, so my name is Kim Meadows and I'm the training director here at NAUDUP. Um, I have been in this position for about a year, but previous to that, unlike David, who's in Memphis, I'm actually here in Georgia. <laughs> Although our main office is in Missouri, but I am here in Georgia. Um, I worked at a local workforce development board for 15 years. I worked um, in Northeast Georgia. Um, and just a little bit about my background, uh, I, I graduated from the University of West Georgia with a degree in technology support systems. So I thought I was going to be a computer specialist, come around checking everybody's computer. 
um, after I graduated, I don't think I've worked on a computer since. So, you know, kind of fell into the field of workforce development. Um, my first job out of college, I was there for about a year and I was laid off from that job. And I ended up going to a staffing agency that um, I ended up being a receptionist at our local community college. Um, and then that's kind of how I came into the field of workforce development. But like David was saying, it's just a field that I've loved. Um, I've been in this field now for 20 years and the CWDP certification has, um, has really been a big help to me because again, that is not what my field was in. That's not what I, you know, what my studies were in. So going through that CWDP certification was wonderful. But I think one of the things that's even, you know, just as wonderful is that recertification process because you're also having to hold yourself accountable for your professional development. Um, so I received my CWDP, I think in 2014. And of course the world has changed since 2014. And I think it's important, um, not only as workforce development, but you know, in, in any industry that you stay on top of the current trend. So I think that's one of the good things about recertification for the CWDP is that you're holding yourself accountable for your professional development. Um, and so, like David was saying earlier, NADOP has, um, we've decided, or one of our goals is to ensure that we're offering at least 20 hours of free professional development training um, each year. And so we do that a few different ways. So we have, similar to what you have here with Max Minutes, but we call it 30 Minutes of Excellence. Um, so on the fourth Wednesday of every month, um, we have different topics that we go through. We have different subject matter experts and different people from the field who come in and talk about different topics in workforce development. So the one that's actually upcoming next week is on um, how to make your workforce centers more accessible. Um, so we'll be doing that uh, for the month of July, but that is free to not up and non not up members. So you don't have to be a member. Um, and again, we do that the fourth Wednesday of every month. If you go to our website, you'll see all of the different um, 30 minutes of excellent sessions that we have. Then in addition to that, we also just like you're doing here, we record those sessions. So we also have a not up YouTube channel and you can go to our YouTube channel and view any of our previous presentations as well. Um, so we do that in addition to, we do virtual academies each year. We do two in-person conferences. We do one that's geared toward youth professionals. And then we do one that is geared toward anybody in the workforce industry, which is our annual conference. Um, those are in person, but we also have a virtual component. Um, and then we do two academies each year that are on different workforce topics that are virtual academies. So um, that's just another way that we we try to provide that professional development here at NADA. So I want to just start off by you know saying that what we're doing at NADA, and also just talk to you a little bit about a grant. Um, that NADAP has received. We're actually in year two of the grant. Um, it's a grant through the Department of Labor and it's called Next Level Now. And really what this grant is about is technical assistance throughout the workforce system. So NADAP is a partner in the Next Level Now grant, but there are um, actually four different organizations that are partners. So it's NADAP, it's the National Association of Workforce Boards, um, third sector is a partner, and then the lead partner is um, Softful Partners. So really what this is, is a technical assistance grant for the workforce system. Um, we provide technical assistance and uh, we have it in four different tiers. Um, one is what we call universal. Um, so those are webinars on specific topics. Um, and all of these can be found on Workforce GPS. So we've done, since the inception of this grant, we've probably done um, I think about 10 to 15 webinars um, and on a variety of different topics. We've done it on outreach. We've done braided funding. We've done service, uh, services to immigrants um, and refugees. We've done one on serving historically marginalized populations. Um, so those are all found on the Workforce GPS um, platform. Um, another tier is what we call Roundtable. Um, this is a little more condensed. So whereas our webinars, um, our webinars can hold up to about 1,200 people. Our roundtables are smaller. They're about 100 people. And then we bring in subject matter experts and we have different um, breakout rooms where you can go into and, learn and get uh, different TA topics in the roundtable. 
And then lastly, we have what we call peer-to-peer. -peer. And peer-to-peer -peer is really where we get one workforce agency that is doing something really good and another workforce agency that may be struggling in that area and we pair them together and they learn from each other, which is, um, that's an another tier of the Next Level Now professional development. Um, so how do you get connected with Next Level Now? You can go to workforcegps.org and go to communities and you can just click on next level now um, and you can become um, just a partner and you'll get all of the information, all of the different webinars, all the different trainings that are coming up. Um, some of the upcoming trainings, just so you know, we have a career coaching cohort, which is gonna be amazing. Um, it is free, it is capped off at 75 people. But again, I came into the field as a career advisor and the training that is going to be in this cohort is going to be, um, it's going to be good for anybody who is in that career coaching field. So it's going to run from September until December. Um, and we will have two hour courses each month in addition to webinars. And again, it's, it's um, free to anybody who's accepted into that cohort. Um, we are also getting ready to do training for business service representatives. Um, one of the good things about Next Level Now is we do assessments before we put the training together. So we actually survey and interview uh, people who are doing that work and ask them what type of training they want. So we're in the process now of doing that assessment. <laughs> and once we get the results back from that assessment, we will uh, begin delivering that training. And then we have a couple of trainings coming up, one on engaging youth, the youth population, and um, one on changing occupational segregation. So those are coming up. But again, you can connect with us on Workforce GPS and um, go under communities and click on next level now. So that is all I have. And again, if you have any questions, you can definitely reach out to me at Kim at nodup.org and I'll be happy to answer any of those. Thanks so much, Kim. Um, and I know, you know, y'all been, you know, listening through, um, we've had a couple of questions come through the chat that David and um, folks have answered. So thanks for that. But just as a note, um, you do not have to be a MAX member to participate in these. You do have to be a NADA member. Um, but certainly if you are going through some of our MAX Academy trains, that'll help count towards that CWDP recertification. So all good things. Um, join everything. We're all wonderful organizations. And so um, you will maximize your professional development experiences through participation in both. Um, we've got a couple of questions um, that have come through. And so David and Kim, I'll defer to you who wants to kick these off, but um, had one, you know, can you talk a little bit about um, career progression that you've seen as a result of someone getting this certification? Um, do y'all see organizations preferring these kinds of candidates or maybe, um, you know, just y'all know that these skill sets are really what it takes to kind of continue to grow in this field, but would love your perspective there. You know, this, this kind of goes, uh, I'm taking this to a different direction slightly, but it's a good answer to the question. We have many organizations across the country in different states that strongly support the CWDP. Uh, many of, for example, in Colorado, many of the local areas use the CWDP as a source of, of training uh, for their new hires. Uh, now, there is a requirement to have at least one year experience when you apply for the CWDP, but you can start your training anytime up to there. So those local managers already have a professional development program set for those that, that they hire. It's to go through the training once you have that one year experience, become a CWDP, and then they have training based on those five competencies that they can provide at the local level or through NADA. Uh, so it can be a good tool as a professional development guide for your local area. So yes, we have many employers that put this even in their yearly evaluations of what they want their uh, team members to do. So there are scenarios where people's career progression is based on earning and maintaining that CWDP. 
Colorado strong, Florida strong, Michigan strong, Maryland strong. There are several states that do use this as a tool of professional development and a course of continuing professional development. There are employers, um, I hate to call names, but I, I'm going to. Uh, one is CERCO, S-E-R-C-O. They get grants across the nation and they work specifically with individuals who are leaving, transitioning from military to the private sector, and they also work with their, their families. In their grants, whenever they apply for federal funds, they put in their proposals that they will have professionals who are working and doing this work the CWDP, and there are a couple of other credentials, I think, that they mention. One, I believe, still is the Global Career Development Facilitator, GCDF. I think that's right. <laughs> but I, I used to have that credential as well. Uh, but um, they will only hire people who either have the CWDP or I believe you have like two to three months to earn your CWDP, but at the end of the day, if you don't meet these requirements to have one of those credentials, they will terminate you. Uh, and, and their work is all uh, remote. So there are people from multiple states that work for them uh, in their grants. So. That's just a couple of examples of how it can be used for professional development and a tool uh, in a local area, but there are national companies that recognize the CWDP. And I also would ask if, if you're doing this for your employer, definitely talk to your employer about will they, will they pay for it? Will they recognize that? Uh, will they support your continuing uh, professional development? No, David, I think that's great advice. Um, we had some questions come through the chat, and David, I think you've answered part of this, but you know, how long do you have to take the exam after your training? And then, David, you shared that um, you know you can either show your competency knowledge and complete the training or take the exam. You don't need to do both. Um, right. And so someone asked us a follow-up question. So if they've received their NADA certificate of completion from Dynamics, they don't need to pay to take the exam as well. Is that correct? It, yes. And, okay. and I'm glad that you asked that specific. Each of these courses, and there are four approved training providers, you can click and go directly to their courses, but each of them will evaluate your skills level either by quizzes uh, as you're going through the competency. So they're going to give you a certificate at the end of the course that says you've, you've met the requirements to complete their course. So at that point, that's proof. If you, we did a, a pilot group, those who scored well with the exam had at least three to five years experience uh, in workforce development. And they, they had more than one position. And I think that's very relevant because if you have different positions, then you're exposed to different, uh, uh, different resources, responsibilities, so you learn new things. And if, you, if you're thinking about the exam, print those five core competencies with all their bullet points and do a true self-examination. Basically, there's going to be 20 questions on the exam. It's 100 questions total on each of the five competencies. Labor market information is tough for a lot of people. They use it, but they don't know they use it. Uh, understanding the big overall picture of workforce development, who the partners are, how everyone interacts with each other. Those were the two competencies that when used to, you could 
write with pen and paper on how you obtain this knowledge that gave people the most problems. So at the end of the day, if you do a true examination of all those bullet points and you come up at 60, 70% you're comfortable with, then don't take the exam take one of the courses. If you're very confident that you could score 80% or more on that exam, you do get two chances within a 12 month period, then consider the exam. Most people, I would say 80% of the people that apply take the training and no matter what level they've been at, they we get overwhelmingly good feedback from taking the training. Those that, like, I've got this and want to take the exam, that's awesome. That can be a way you can you can prove your knowledge. Great. Yeah, and I see Sabrina, if I can just add in here what she yeah. said, uh, this is great. Thank you. Now I can add the certification to my resume. And I think that's really important because if you're applying to an employer that does not know about the CWDP, this is really your opportunity to shine. So if they ask you, you know, what, tell me about the CWDP certification, you can talk about all these different trainings that you went through in order to get the certification. So I think, you know, it's added, um, it's a value add on the resume, even even if the employer does not know about the CWDP, it gives you your opportunity to tell them this training that you've been through. And yes, CERCO is with military career transition. And yes, once you complete a course, you're not a CWDP until you go through that three-step application process with NADA. We will, at the end of your review, uh, you'll be notified, congratulations, you can now use the CWDP uh, credential in your signature line or in business correspondence, and we will email an electronic certificate that you could uh, actually print and frame. It will have a certification number, and it will also have your expiration date. Great. Well, great advice from both of y'all to think about what are your skill sets? How do you best position yourself um, and make sure y'all go through the CWT D page on the NADA website? Um, we had one question come through, said they didn't see the career coaching under the Next Level Now program. So I don't know if y'all got a specific spot we can have folks um, make sure they can get that information, but I think y'all shared so many good resources. Um, we're just grateful helping direct everybody. Um, Really? Yeah, they can actually, you can actually go to our NADA website. It should be posted there as well. So you'll see career coaching cohort and that link should be posted there. Okay, great. So we'll try to look through and see that. Um, I've got questions coming through. If, if information is going to be emailed out, we're going to send out the recording. Um, and then y'all have got the emails here for um, you've got questions and I know we've shared links. So we'll make sure to incorporate kind of all that information as the follow-up. But um, if, you know, there are notes here or links here that are useful, um, you know, make sure you snag those two. We'll try to send everything out and the recording will be available afterwards. So you'll have that as resources um, to move forward. Um, we do have a question about kind of the youth component. Um, and I was curious, um, y'all could elaborate a little bit more on how y'all are engaging um, youth. You know, yeah, so every year, uh, David, I'll start off and then you can yeah. um, pick up after me if that's okay, because <laughs> whatever I leave out. But every year in November, we have what we call our youth symposium, and it's an in-person conference. And re really, that conference is targeted toward uh, professionals who work with youth up to age 24. Um, usually that age 16 to 24, but uh, we'll have our upcoming um, youth symposium in November. And this information is on our website as well, but it's November 6th through the 8th. And it's gonna be in Las Vegas, um, Nevada during that time. Um, so we have five different learning tracks that we put together that um, this conference is gonna focus on. One is the, uh, the ETA has now priorities for youth workforce development. So they set some uh, priorities aside specifically for youth development. And so that's one of our tracks, but including that track are apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeships for youth, um, youth mental health, quality jobs and career pathways. 
So we do have workshops that are going to be on those priorities. We also have a learning track that's going to be on career coaching and career counseling. Um, so how do you really uh, take youth and not only think about what their, you know, that initial job is, but how do they use that as a career pathway to move up? Um, so those are a couple of examples of the learning tracks that we have. Another one that we have is going to be digital and technology solutions. So we know now a lot of things are moving toward AI and, you know, virtual. Um, so that's going to be one of the learning tracks as well. But uh, all of our learning tracks at our youth symposium are focused on those workforce pro uh, professionals that work with those youth under age 24. And, you know, Kim, I might add that a lot of the training that is on career coaching that NADAP does, it's not specifically geared toward youth in how things are phrased. Like the youth symposium is specifically for that. But uh, the career training opportunities that, that NADAP provides often is working, is learning how to understand the traumatic barriers that so many people who come into the, the workforce centers for help or the, when you're out recruiting, how to identify so many of these barriers. And often I do think that those are more relevant probably to out of school youth typically than with adults or dislocated workers. So I think there's a lot of intense training in these career coaching uh, situations that, that even though they don't say this is for youth, they're really geared at, at really understanding these, these harder to recognize and actually harder to deal with uh, uh, mental challenges, mental health, uh, uh, addictions, uh, e even people who could be victims of uh, sex trafficking, uh, and also understanding the, the DEI part of all of this. Are you actually including everyone uh, in, in who you're serving? So I think a lot of these, even though they don't say this is youth training, in some scenarios, I think they're more relevant and meaningful to those that are serving youth. Mm -hmm. We actually have a webinar that's coming up on Next Level Now that's going to be the second week in August, and it's talking about how to engage youth and how to really empower those youth voices, and it's, it's really um, speaking to the fact of how you use youth as uh, a part of your program design. So not that we're as adults sitting here making these programs and thinking like we know what is best for the youth, but actually having them as partners at the table and asking them questions. What's, you know, what worked well for you? What do, what would you like to see in this program? Um, having them a part of our youth councils and really being involved in that. So that's what our webinar on Next Level Now is gonna be about in August as well is just how to engage youth when you're thinking about designing programs. Great advice um, to make sure we're thinking, you know, not only about adults, but really, you know, the full talent pipeline and, and how we make sure we're thinking about this, not only from those short term perspectives, but um, truly over the long term. Um, well, I wanted to kind of ask, too, I mean, I know we've got folks on the call that are kind of at every you know stage of their professional career, whether it's entry level or middle manager, um, seasoned professional, you know, what kind of advice do y'all have for um Many people in different stages of their careers, what credentials should they be doing, what professional development opportunities are really, um, you know, the best bet for them to continue to grow their skills in advance? You know, one way I would like to answer that is that I hope everyone who is a workforce development professional understands that this is an ever evolving industry. If you come in, and you are in one position for 30 years, that's awesome. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to grow even if you're in that one particular position for all of those years. The people that you serve change. Uh, occupations in demand by business and industry change. Rules and regulations with Department of Labor change. 
you can't only do one thing for year after year after year after year and meet the needs of what the federal government wants you to do and what your customers need from you. And I also want to make it clear to everyone that the people that are coming in and seeing you on a daily basis, that's not your ultimate customer. Your ultimate customer, and some people don't like to hear this, but it is business and industry. We get these funds to train people to meet the demand of our local and regional business and industries. We're not training people just to better educate them, to, to make them understand their the barriers they may have and how to overcome them. We are doing all of this work so that they can be successfully employed, self-sufficient, and have a great life. But being employed is the ultimate goal of who we serve, and those demands change constantly. So my advice is you have to have professional development to grow and to be relevant in what you're doing in those to those that you're serving. Yep, I would absolutely agree. And uh, one of the things that I always think about is the very first um, presentation that I did at a national conference was on outreach strategies. It was back in 2014. And I did another um, just a couple of months ago at a professional conference, and it was on outreach strategies. And it's like that's one of those things that it always changes, right? So um, professional development, I feel like it's the same way. So again, whether you're in that leadership or if you're just starting out in the field of workforce development, like David said, it's ever evolving. So there's that always that opportunity for growth. Um, a couple of things that NADOP is doing upcoming is for those entry level people who are just coming into workforce, we are having a career services academy that's going to be held in August. And that's for um, really entry level people coming into the field. Um, at the beginning of the year, uh, we are looking to have a leadership cohort. So that's for those people, those seasoned professionals who are now, you know, and we hear this all the time, leading um, a new normal, you know, post pandemic. Now things are virtual. People are working from home. Um, you know, you have those mental health challenges in the workplace. So we're having a virtual academy for that leadership level as well. So we try to, you know, reach everybody from entry level. There's something for everybody from entry level to mid-level, to frontline staff, supervisors, up until executive um, leadership. No, I think the resources y'all provide are tremendous um, and really exciting. And I know all those resources, again, are on their website. So certainly everybody spends some time. Um, and I'm so glad that y'all did mention that because I think from an industry perspective, we see the fact that jobs are changing daily based especially on the availability of talent. You know, if people aren't able to find workers, they're saying, well, you know, we're moving towards automation anyways, like we'll just kind of speed all this up. Especially all of that was really, um, you know, increased during COVID, um, digitization just exploded. And so I think it's so important for us to make sure again, that we're keeping these good relationships with our workforce development professionals because you need those open lines of communication to really think this through. Um, but, you know, we know that these workforce shortages are going to be persistent. I think everything you read shows that they're not going away anytime soon. Um, it's just how much we can exacerbate and, you know, mitigate kind of what we're seeing. Um, so I'd love y'all's thoughts, too, just on making sure people understand the, the true value in going through professional development, having this lifelong learning. I think that's what we're trying to think through. Um, you know, I, we see that from, you know, K-12 you know, adult workers, the ability for you just to do one thing every day for the rest of your life for 40 years is is not, you know, kind of the future of the workforce or the current states. Um, so would love your thoughts too, as we're making sure we're preparing, uh, you know, people for that. How does that translate to the need to keep workforce development professionals um, up to speed and um, with top line skills? You know, um, a couple of thoughts on that. Our own profession, we are having so much turnover and we have a lot of, of uh, group memberships with not an organization will will have so many uh, spots that they'll purchase and add so many people to these groups. 
we have probably the largest number of empty seats in those groups that we've ever had because people leave and they're having a hard time hiring new people. So not only is this the, the case with most employers outside of workforce development, it's the same scenario within workforce development. And one of the things that I think it is hard maybe for us to understand, and I'm going to say this whether it's politically correct or not, a bachelor's degree for the huge part is not relevant anymore. Uh, when I first started and for the first few years I was in, in a, a, a case manager, I mean, your ideal candidate was someone who had enough hours, maybe had dropped out of college, didn't have the funding, whatever, and you could get them a bachelor's degree. It was like, wow, this is your ultimate recruitment. You're going to get them a bachelor's degree and they can get a great job. That's not the case now. That's not what employers are looking for. Now, no one throw rocks at me. There are careers that are relevant in demand that require a bachelor degree, but I bet I don't have the proof of this. It's probably less than 20% of all the jobs that are out there in your local area now. So short-term training. An employer wants to know that you have the skills to do the job that they have. If it's welding, they don't care that you took English comp. It, 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 they want relevant short-term training. And to grow, you have to keep that training as technology changes the requirements of the jobs. So I think that career ladders are, are much more important now than they've ever been because to stay relevant, you have to continue your professional development, yes, in workforce, but also outside. Your skills have to change as those job requirements change. And things have really changed. I think that's another thing I'll mention youth and working with youth. What is their goals are different than my goals. They don't want a job. They don't want to retire with one company 40 years later. They want to do what meets their income needs, their personal needs now. And when that job no longer meets those personal goals and needs, they want to do something else. It's not bad. We just have to understand that just like our profession, everything changes. We're not in a world to where you do one skill, one thing all your life, and we have to train people accordingly. And I would just echo what David said. So, you know, just from a personal level, um, when we're thinking about worker shortages, so I have a 21-year-old daughter who has an amazing work ethic, but one thing that I've noticed about her and her generation is that they um, know how to go get jobs or income that are not necessarily tied to a schedule. So she knows if she wants to, for instance, go to a concert and the concert is $200, she'll go to DoorDash until she gets that $200. So she's she's working. She still she has that work ethic, but it's no longer tied to a schedule where, you know, I have to be here from nine to three and, you know, I have to wait two weeks until I get my check. It's more, um, I can make my own schedule and on the next day, I'm going to get money in my account. So um, I think uh, I think that generation is probably thinking about work a little different. And then the, the other thing that I was going to say as we're talking about worker shortages um, with the Next Level Now group and even through some of our training that we're doing at NADA, um, we've really focused a lot on the returning citizen formerly incarcerated population. And when you look at those numbers, um, I think the st stat was about 600,000 are released from um, prisons and jails each year. Um, but sometimes they're not able to get jobs because of backgrounds that the employers require. So when we're thinking about, you know, um, workforce shortages, that is an entire population. 600,000 people a year being released, um, that's an entire population. So um, we've done a lot of training and still looking forward to doing training with people um, and organizations who work with the reentry population. 
Yeah, and Kim, I think that's such a big point. I know we've had some changes um, in laws here in Georgia that have changed some of the liability for employers, which has allowed them to make sure that they are really thinking about this population um, with having some of those, um, you know, liability removed and a little bit of the risk, um, which is great. And we've seen a lot of our employers say, you know, do I really need this on my application? You know, I would say employers are thinking through to your point, David, do I really need a four-year degree? Is that really something that is required? We've seen a lot of companies that are, are really thinking critically about what's actually necessary and and where can they find um, some wiggle room. I, I certainly think that this is a huge, and I know we've seen a huge increase in um, companies looking at second chance hiring. Um, and I think we've all seen too, the positive numbers, if you have a job, you're, you know, the rates of recidivism go so much down, which is great. You know, everyone wants folks to be successful and to have um, strong um, families and um, build up our economy, contribute to your local community and the state as a whole. So um, such positive things um, for the state. So just requires everyone to think differently, innovate. And I, I would certainly say that change is the only constant we see. Um, so hop on or, you know, stay behind. That's kind of where we're going these days. You know, I do think that the job seeker today probably has a bigger advantage than they've had in in our recent uh, uh, work lives of maybe having the upper hand with you can almost anyone can almost go get a job uh, and, and have a decent wage. I mean, we see the McDonald's and Burger King, fourteen dollars, fifteen dollars an hour starting pay. Uh, but I still think it's very important that we are letting our, that we're building those soft skills with our customers, because even though you can almost go out and get a job easily, that doesn't mean that you don't keep that job. And even like with Kim's example of how her daughter utilizes opportunities, she doesn't have a schedule, it's flexible, but she still has to have those time management skills that when she is doing DoorDash or whatever, that she's carrying out the requirements of those jobs. So even though you may have the advantage in getting a job, the employer is still the employer. And when it comes to a point to where, let's be honest, they're losing money on what you're doing for them, they don't quit giving you money. So it doesn't mean that you're, just because you can get a job doesn't mean that you're going to retain it. So that's why I think it's still more important than it's ever or always been that we're teaching these soft skills. Mm -hmm. So no matter what they choose as their source of income, they're going to carry out their responsibilities towards that employer. Being on time, being dependable, getting along with others, uh, taking criticism. I mean, these are things that if you watch the news every day, Everyone can do whatever they want to do, say whatever they want to say, be whatever they want to be. In your personal life, you can do all that, but that doesn't mean you can do that in your employed life. No, absolutely. I think that, you know, we know that those soft skills have, were important pre-COVID and they're going to be, you know, important um, over the long term, especially if you want to advance um, and think about those opportunities. We've got two questions and I want to make sure we get to them. Um, first one was about a nonprofit in Atlanta working with the reentry population. I know y'all probably have some great resources, but I would also suggest the Georgia Justice Project um, and we can include a link to them. They do a lot of great work and they've presented on Max Minutes before too. So um, we'll make sure to share that. And then, um, but would love um, to do like all specific resources um, for thinking about how to engage the reentry population. Yeah, so um, like I said, we have we've just done some um, training through the Next Level Now Collaborative. We've had somebody, we've had a couple of uh, local areas who work with the DOL grant called the Second Chance Grant, and um, we've 
we've had somebody else who had different grants, but their contact information is going to be on our Next Level Now website. Um, again, one of the things that we do through Next Level Now is that peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, and you can go to our website, to Next Level Now website, and we have, we call it a TA tracker. And you can just go in and type what your technical assistance needs are, and then we can connect you with that person or that group who's doing that exact same thing. Um, but yeah, you can reach out to me, please, Kim at Nautil, and I can provide you with those links exactly of where, where that information is found. Perfect. So reach out to Kim and then I choose the Georgia Justice Project link as well. We've got a couple minutes left and we've got one more question. So um, David and Kim, you know, would you recommend that educators that serve as work-based learning coordinators look into the certification? And Kim, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with this, but these are really, um, you know, folks within the school system that help connect students with employment opportunities um, within their communities. So would love y'all's thoughts on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'll just start from my personal, um, from my personal journey, but um, I do think anybody who, and we always say, I always say, who helps people get jobs or who helps jobs get people, if you are in that connection area, then this definitely is a certification that you would, that I would say um, you could look up into, um, number one, because of the competencies. So the competencies, like they are broad throughout workforce development, um, but also because of the training and then the recertification processes. So um, I definitely think that's something as a work for or a work-based learning coordinator that will be beneficial to your career. And we do have, uh, that's probably through via email, like people going to our website. That's probably one of the biggest questions that I get is um, I'm a mid-school yes. career coach. Uh, do I qualify? Yes, that is workforce development. Even though the people that you're serving that day at that age are not job seekers, you're preparing them for their journey to become employed. And, you know, this is another way I think things are much better than 20 years ago when I started. It used to be divided education or workforce. Education is workforce. And we're seeing so much better partnerships with schools, with community colleges, four-year colleges, that education and workforce are the same. They're not separate and they don't need to be in separate silos. Absolutely. And I think the program too, Next Level Now, y'all created is so collaborative and really builds on that. So I think it's um, so helpful. Um, but certainly, um, just again, want to thank Kim and David for their time and expertise this morning. Um, could not be more grateful for you helping us think through these programs and, and what's a good fit. Um, and I know Joy's um, and Kim and David have all shared a lot of good links in here for the Next Level Now program and the CWP and every other resource. So um, make sure to snag those. But again, Kim and David, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Happy Friday. Happy <laughs> Friday for sure. Um, so just a couple of things to close us out this morning um, before we wrap up. Um, if you are not a member of Max, um, we highly encourage you to join. Um, it's something we provide, obviously, a tremendous amount of resources. Um, this is our free program to those that are not members, but there's a lot of resources that we provide to members exclusively. So if you've got questions, um, please reach out to any of us. Um, Joy Wilkins also has all the information you ever could need. Um, so again, we're happy to share more about this, but this has kind of got some top level takeaways, um, really focus on convening and bringing people together um, to talk about workforce development. Again, a special thanks to our anchor investors. If you work with these organizations, please thank them for their investment in the workforce development community in Metro Atlanta. Um, we're so grateful for everything they do um, to continue to push our state forward. And that is all for me today. Um, again, Kim and David, thank you so much. Um, appreciate your time. I hope everyone has a great Friday and a great weekend and we'll see y'all soon. Thank you. Thanks Bye. so much.